Hey guys, welcome to another Shop Talk Live. Uh, glad everyone could make it today. Um, if one of my auto, um, moderators would give me an audio check, I would appreciate it. Uh, for those of you who are new to Shop Talk Live, this is the first in a new playlist series called the Breeder Series. Um, it's a little bit more advanced in nature than uh, what we've done in the, uh, the beginner series. Uh, but for those of you who are new to be, to uh, Paternix, we do have a beginner series playlist over on the channel. You can check that out. Uh, it'll pretty pretty much get you through uh, everything from you know buying eggs to incubating them, brooding them, uh, growing out, back into breeding again, and hatching out your own eggs all over again. So uh, we do go live every Friday at 7.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Um, and it usually runs about an hour to an hour and a half long. Uh, what we do is about uh, 20 to 30 minutes of a presentation, and then we jump over into the uh, chat room and take your questions. <clears throat> so we do have a uh, channel uh, supporter or backer uh, that is Northwest Quail Farm, and they give us... Uh, um, your choice of either the automatic watering system or a starter pack of quail egg cartons. And that's going to go to uh, one lucky winner tonight. You'll get your choice of either one of those. Um, you can also get a 10% off uh, their uh, eBay store if you use the coupon code CCORNER10 uh, during checkout. So uh, in this segment, guys, we're going to be talking about creating a spiral breeding program or clan breeding uh, it's also known by um, we're going to basically be going through the basics of that uh, talking about how to how to get a spiral breeding program set up and then how to expand it into the rest of your operation um, I am going to keep it uh, pretty basic I don't want to get you know too in depth on it and it's really it's pretty easy to understand uh, when, once you understand the basics there's just, you know, a few other tips and stuff to, that goes along with it. Uh, so we'll jump into that. And again, I will be taking questions uh, after the presentation uh, in the chat room. So if you would, uh, please type the letter Q in front of your question. Uh, that way I'm not going to overlook it when I'm going through the chat room. Sometimes it gets going pretty fast and I don't, uh, I don't always uh, catch every single question. So, okay, let's go ahead and jump right into it. I think uh, JL says uh, everything looks good, sound is good, so great. We'll go ahead and jump right into it. Okay, so first off, what is a spiral or clan breeding program? Basically, uh, this system uh, entails creating three up to five uh, clans or group uh, of, of birds that what you're going to use to breed and each clan is identified by uh, the females uh, and what you do is you rotate the males out of each clan for each generation into the next clan and uh, what that does it helps you maintain a genetic diversity uh, inside a closed flock and now by closed flock I mean a flock where you're not bringing in outside birds or outside genetics so basically you've got your, your starting flock and you're working only with those birds and uh, breeding them in such a manner that uh, your genetic diversity um, is going to stay, uh, or it's not going to get out of hand to where you've got, you know, uh, inbreeding. Uh, we are going to talk a little bit about inbreeding and line breeding uh, later on in this, but uh, uh, spiral breeding is a method of breeding that will keep the genetic diversity and it's also going to help you improve your lines because you're always selecting the best of the best to move on to the next uh, clan. So basically um, setting up your, your clans, what you need for each color of bird that you want to keep, you need three clans. Now I know that sounds like a lot, but you know, I've got five different colors. I've got to have, you know, 15 different clans. It's really not that much because uh, clan size uh, doesn't really matter. You could have as little as, you know, a one to two ratio, like, you know, one rooster and two hens per clan, all the way up to, you know, if you're uh, colony breeding, you know, and you're doing hundreds of birds 
uh, you can do it the same way. But regardless, you still need three clans. And the initial clan, the colors when you're setting it up, are always uh, are always bred together, the same color birds. Um, I do want to talk about, uh, actually, let me go back. Uh, once you got your, your clan set up or selected, uh, you need to have an identifier for your, plan, your clan or your group. We'll, we'll just call them a group from here on out. Um, the identifiers can be something as simple as a color like I have here, um, you know, green, blue, and yellow, uh, one for each group, or they can be numbers, you know, groups one, two, and three, or you can even name them, you know, you can name them your, uh, the name of your fam favorite hen in each clan, whatever it is, it doesn't matter. Um, but you need to set up your, your first clan and start breeding those clans. And we're going we're gonna to start out by saying one male to a group of females. So we'll just go ahead and say, you know, for this presentation, say a one to five ratio. Um, so when you breed that, that first year or that first generation, all the chicks that hatch out in, in this case, we're looking at the yellow clan. Uh, the hen is the fully yellow bird. The rooster is the, the black bird with the yellow dot. He is from that yellow clan. Um, every, all the offspring are labeled by the clan that they originated from. So if the, the, every chick that hatches out from a hen or from a group of hens, say in the yellow group, all the offspring, all the chicks will all be part of the yellow clan. And when we get into record keeping and identifying your birds, we're going to talk a little bit more about that. But um, the only thing that changes in each clan is as your chicks hatch out, you're going to select the best of the best. You want to take all your best hens and they will stay in that yellow group. You're going to select your best rooster. And if you're ready to uh, rotate to the next let me back up a minute. I want to say, uh, when, when we say generation, normally that's one breeding. Uh, your your batch, first batch of chicks is one generation. Um, seeing as how Caternix uh, reproduce and grow so fast, you can actually do multiple generations. Uh, in this case, say they were, they were all yellow. Say you did uh, three different hatches from the yellow chicks. They All the chicks would still be yellow, but you're only going to select the top five hens and one of the best roosters. The top five hens will stay in that yellow group while the rooster rotates over to the next group. And we'll show you on that on this page. But regardless, this is probably a little bit better picture to show you. Regardless of the um, sex, the chicks always stay within the mother's clan. So the, the, the blue hen or the blue clan all their offspring are going to be blue, same with the green, same with the yellow. Um, and here we go. We're, we're talking about selecting the best chicks um, that are better than the parents. Uh, when selecting your hens, you want to select uh, hens that uh, are as good as the mother, if not better. Uh, but the most, most important one is actually the rooster. You want to make sure that the rooster, uh, you can see, well, behind me, it's the top one. Uh, that's supposed to be a rooster. Uh, he was the best one because he's going to move on to that next uh, that next uh, group. So um, let's see. As far as identifying your chicks um, or any of your birds, uh, the easiest way to do is tag your birds either by putting uh, uh, colored zip ties or leg bands on them. Um, if you're going to go by color. Um, you can do it, you can easily get, you know, blue, green, and yellow zip ties and tag the chicks. That way, if you do have an issue where one of the birds gets out of a, a cage, uh, you can easily identify which clan or which group that bird goes back into. <clears throat> so after our first generation we've gone through, we've picked our, our best chicks and our best hens. The hens stayed with the mother, uh, but our best roosters... Uh, will be moved over into the next clan. And this would be second generation. So the 
the blue rooster is going to move over into the green clan. The green rooster is going to move into the yellow, and the yellow is going to jump into the uh, the blue clan. And that's your first rotation. Then you just repeat the cycle all over again. So here's what it would look like after uh, your second generation started having uh, laying eggs and uh, chicks hatching out. Um, you can see that the uh, on the blue clan, uh, which is at the top, the rooster from the blue clan is now moved down into the yellow clan. And the rooster from the yellow clan, which he was originally yellow, he has moved over into the green clan. And the green rooster has moved over into the blue clan. Um, I, I do want to say if you, if you have a rooster or if you have a batch of chicks that say come out of the yellow clan and you go through and you're selecting your, your rooster, but the rooster isn't as nice or as good as the father um, that he originated from, it's okay to take that father and rotate him into the next group because uh, basically you're doing the same thing. <clears throat> uh, again, you want to replace uh, all your breeders uh, as better chicks come along. Um, so, you know, with Caternix, uh, you know, growing so up so fast and laying eggs so fast, you're probably not going to want to replace your breeders out of the first generation of chicks. You can go ahead and, you know, breed, you know, three, four, probably even five generations, and then go ahead and select the chicks that you want to put into that breeding program and retire the, uh, the hens that are already in there. Um, okay, uh, the chicks' genetics are going to be a combination of the clan colors. So if you've got um, a yellow rooster uh, who is in with the blue clan, uh, your chicks are going to be um, blue chicks because they're they're coming from the blue uh, clan. And I actually kind of have the dots backwards on these. It should be a blue chick with a yellow dot, but you get what I mean. Um, and then the green the green hen, um, her chick is considered to be in the green, but he, she's also carrying genetics from the blue. So you can use that in your uh, record keeping. Um, it's just going to help you to uh, be able to identify what birds have been bred, you know, with what uh, with what groups and what roosters. Um, the paperwork on this really isn't that tricky. I can almost do it. I've only got one spiral breeding program set up, and that's for my pharaohs right now. But I can almost do it just by looking at the bands that I have them uh, tagged with. You know, so I can walk up to a cage. I can see, okay, you know, this is the yellow cage. Um, the rooster has a blue band on them, so I know that that rooster originated out of the blue group and was moved into the yellow. And then when, when it comes time to move them again, you'll know uh, that you don't want to put another blue back in with the yellow. You'll want to go, like, green into the yellow, just so you're not doing the same thing every time. Um I want to talk a little bit about line breeding. Um, I hear a lot of people, you know, say, how many generations can I breed uh, before I need to replace uh, my bloodlines? Um, first off, if you're doing a spiral breeding program, you should really never have to uh, bring in new blood. Um, it's a little bit uh, iffy if you do bring in the new blood, uh, because one, you have no idea where the bird's origins are. You don't know anything, the genetic makeup of that bird. Uh, they call it outcrossing. Um, but the problem is, is most people that are selling you new blood, unless they're experienced breeders and they have their own spiral breeding program, um, you're most likely just going to get a bunch of mixed genetics. Uh, there's a difference between breeders and producers. Uh, producers just, you know, breed a whole bunch of birds and, uh, you know, it's kind of a, a crapshoot what you're going to get from them. Hopefully, you know, if you do end up having to bring in new blood, you can get it from a breeder that uh, can let you know the, the entire genetic makeup of that bird, where it originated from, um, where it came from out of their spiral breeding program. So, <clears throat> but as far as line breeding, 
if you produce, say, a chick that has some really, really nice uh, color or um, markings, whatever, and you want to, uh, how can I word that? And you want to make sure that that is, you know, stabilized in that line. What you can do is line breed, and that is basically breeding along a line. Um, it would be like breeding, you know, mother to son or father to daughter. And that's just going to reinforce the genetic makeup of, you know, whatever your, whatever trait it is that you're looking, um, you know, to enforce. So uh, I would look at line breeding more um, as a tool uh, to use in your spiral breeding or clan breeding uh, program. Um, I would definitely not do a line breeding all the time. You're going to end up, you know, in just a matter of a couple of generations, uh, you're going to, you know, run into some uh, weakened genetics and it's, it's going to give you problems. So I, I would stick away with it or stick away from it. Um, and here we are uh, talking about introducing new blood. Again, it's not recommended um, unless you really know the history. Uh, it can be risky at best and it can be uh, deleterious to your flock and undermine all the work that you've done in your spiral breeding program. Um, the nice thing about the spiral breeding program is you can use it to uh, better your flock. And by better, I mean um, bringing out traits that you find desirable, you know, whether it's size, whether it's color, whether it's patterning, um, all of this can be bred for um, and uh, as, if, as you're constantly selecting the best of the best of your offspring and passing that on to the next clan, you're just reinforcing those good traits in your birds and breeding out the bad traits. And some of the traits that, you know, I would uh, try to stay away from, like if you have birds that are overly aggressive, I would call them no matter what they look like. I don't care if they're, you know, the best looking bird that you've ever hatched out. Um, I believe that aggression is, you know, a genetic issue uh, for the most part. And uh, you can breed it out. Uh, same with uh, issues uh, like bad conformity. Uh, if you have birds that we call couch potatoes, they're just always hunched over and bent over. They kind of walk squatted down. All this stuff can be bred out using your, your spiral breeding program. So uh, let me go back to one of these first pictures. Now, let me go back a little bit further. Um, so to get the basic understanding of the spiral breeding program, all you got to remember is in generation one, this is your first generation when you actually put your three groups together. Um, the three groups, obviously the rooster and the hen in each group will be the same color. In this case, two blues, two yellows, and two greens. So that's your first generation. And then when you hatch out chicks from these, from generation one, uh, you are going to select from those the best of the best. The, the little girls or the chicks that you select, or the, the hens, we'll say, because they're not going to be little girls. You're going to let them grow up. Uh, you're going to select them. They're going to stay in the original color group. The roosters, you want to select preferably one that's better than the father because that rooster is going to be passed on to the next, like in this case here, uh, the yellow or the blue rooster is going to go down into the, to the yellow roosters uh, group or the yellow hens group. And then the yellow rooster is going to go over into the green hens group. So, and it's just a continual cycle over and over again. Um, I do want to say that if you want to uh, introduce new genetics, you can do it from within your own group. Say you're working with a group of Italians and you're, you're uh, or we'll say a group of fawn and uh, you're spiral breeding them, but you, you, you reached, uh, we'll just say generation 20 and you're getting concerned about adding new blood. You can always take a pharaoh from one of your other lines. You're not going outside your outside of your operation, you know, to buy clean lines. You just grab a pharaoh from your pharaoh, breed that in or introduce him into it, and he's going to introduce new blood, new genetics, yet 
you still keep that fawn line going. You just added a ferro into it. So you can always use the pharaohs uh, to add into your program, you know, to add new blood. You can also use it to, uh, if you want to create a jumbo line, you can bring some of your jumbo pharaohs and bring them, say again, into a fawn line and get the jumbo size and then start breeding those fawns uh, for the jumbo genetics. I hope I said that right. But that's basically it, guys. I mean, it, it's pretty simple. What I'm going to try to do is uh, upload this PDF over on Facebook. So if you guys want to, you know, go through it again, just to kind of like a refresher. But the basics are the chicks always stay in their color group that they hatched out of. You always want to select the best of the best to pass on to the next clan as far as the roosters go. You want to select the best hens to stay within their group uh, for your next set of breeders. Uh, and yeah, like I said, I will, you know, put this PDF over on the uh, uh, Caternix Corner Facebook group page and you guys can look through that again. So guys, I hope I explained that. I mean, I had a pretty good idea what I wanted to talk about when I was making these images up. But, uh, you know, sometimes things just don't go exactly as you plan. So uh, if you didn't understand something, uh, go ahead and ask in the, uh, the comments, and I'll see if I can't get it straightened out for you. So we'll go ahead and jump into that real quick, and uh, yeah, see how it goes. Um, it looks like we don't have a whole lot of people in here today, so I'm going to go ahead and read all the comments. Uh, it is Good Friday. Woman of Spirit says, Happy Good Friday to all you beautiful, quail-loving people. Uh, absolutely. Thank you. And appreciate it. Glad you could join us today. Uh, Charles says, good Friday to all. Absolutely. Henriette, one of our moderators in the house, says, hello, everyone. Happy Good Friday to all. Robert Davis is in the house, says, hello from Maine. Uh, Little Ridge Farm says, uh, hello, y'all, and welcome. Tony's in the house, says, hi from Toronto. Uh, happy Good Friday. Absolutely. Let's see. Joy Guthrie says, hello, all from Western Oregon. Chill, W cat. Chill, I don't know what that means. <laughs> uh, Little Ridge Farm says, think I'm getting sick. Not a good Friday. Oh, that's not good. Um, hope you get better. Henriette says, get well soon, Little Ridge Farm. Uh, Rebel Mains says, hello from Sacramento, California. Uh, Gary Box says, hello from Indiana. Salvador Santiago says, hello from Puerto Rico. Welcome, Salvador. Glad you could make it. Uh, Nick says, definitely looking forward to this uh, Shop Talk Live. Hope you all are having a wonderful evening. Yeah, Nick, I hope I explained it um, to where you guys can understand it. Okay, to my moderators, there are, uh, looks like some scammers going on in, in the, uh, the bottom. If you guys would uh, block them out of here, please. Uh, Henriette says, uh, make sure you type the letter Q for your questions. Uh, J.L. Murphy says, Evening Terry from Southeast Georgia. Okay, tell me the sound is good. Cynthia says, Good evening from Alabama. Welcome, Cynthia. Glad you could make it. <clears throat> Rebel Main says, I just rehomed 10 male quail today. Uh, I wasn't ready to call them myself. I just started keeping quail on March 18th, so I need time before I can do something like that. Uh, they are going to freezer camp. Uh, yeah, it's uh, it, it'll grow. I mean, you know, once you once you've done one, the rest are a breeze. Uh, L Hornack says hello from Ontario, Canada. Glad you can make it. J L Murphy says ooh ah. <laughs> uh, Lily Rose says I want to enter the drawing. Okay, everybody is actually already entered into the drawing, um, just by being here. Randall says. Uh, Hey, first time live here. Thanks uh, for all you for all y'all do. Learning a lot. Thank you. Glad you could make it. Uh, Brandon says, "Hey Terry, happy Easter weekend from Toronto, Canada." Uh, absolutely, happy Easter to you, and thank you very much. Rob, me too. Says, "How can you fix up who are born swimmer? I mean, who can't stand up?" Um, if it's a chick 
Well, actually, if, it, if it's any bird, if they're having issues, uh, you know, being stable on their feet, uh, I would just call them. I don't even waste my time working with birds like that. You know, that's that's half of the whole uh, um, selecting for genetics. You don't want to keep uh, birds in your flock that, you know, contain, you know, poor genetics or, you know, have issues like that. Uh, Chris says, hello from Sandusky, Ohio. Circle of Life Homestead, I would like to enter the drawing. I have an incubator ready to go. Okay, well, we're not giving away eggs today. Uh, the only thing that is going to be given away is uh, your choice of either the automatic uh, watering system, which is the, the nipples, or the uh, starter quail egg cartons, the starter pack on those. Okay, uh, Nick says, question, is breeding back to Pharaoh and then back to your original birds the only way to find out what mutations are in your line? Um, the easiest way to do it, Nick, is uh, if you're you're questionable about, you know, say a fawn line or an EB line, yes, breed them back to your Pharaohs. The offspring will tell you what that bird is carrying uh, because by breeding, just say an EB or a fawn back to a Pharaoh, a certain percentage are going to be fawn, a certain percentage are going to be uh, whatever else it may be carrying, and a certain percentage is going to be feral. So that is, yes, one of the best ways to uh, determine what they are carrying. Uh, Circle of Lake Holmes says, says, I'm ready for eggs. Well, you can be waiting until Tuesday because we're not giving away eggs tonight. Sorry about that. Taxi 2022 says, I made it, but a little late. Uh, no problem. I'm just glad you can make it. Uh, Tim Baldur's in the house says, I'm here. Happy Friday. Glad you can make it, uh, Tim. Circle of Life Homestead says, love your channel. It has taught me so much. Thank you. I am glad uh, that you are learning from it. Uh, that's why we're doing it. Karen McAllister says, happy Easter, everyone. Absolutely. Thanks, Karen. Uh, Rob Me Too says, where those quail who are swimmers, can they ever survive? I hope you can answer my question. Uh, as far as chicks go, um, the problem with chicks, they get wet, they get chilled. And once a chick gets chilled, they have a really hard time recovering from it. Um, I haven't really had any issues with it. Uh, my waters are, it's a, it's a quart water, but it's got the small basin on it. And a chick could step in it, but it, they would be hard pressed to get their entire uh, uh, body into it. Uh, Karen says, please add me to the drawings. You are in the drawing. Circle of Life says, our family would love to start raising quail. We have chickens and turkeys and rabbits so far. Oh, you got your little homestead already going. Um, yeah, jump into quail. They're very enjoyable, you know, very, <laughs> very prolific. And uh, yeah, they grow up fast. Scuba Healer says, good Friday to you too. Mike Carr says, hello all. Uh, Del Chuchu's in the house says, hello, everyone. Greetings from Cuba. Um, for those of you, um, who are going to be joining us Tuesday on Coternix Corner Live, uh, Del Chuchu, who is also known as Juan over there in Cuba, um, will be joining us. Uh, he put together a little presentation and he's going to be, uh, talking about and showing us how he keeps his quail over there. Um, they have, uh, a few different, uh, markets than we have here in the U.S., so uh, he is going to be uh, covering that. So, um, yeah, join us Tuesday. Mark your calendars. Randall says, questions, when setting up the first three clans, do they need to be from different parents, or can all three clans be off the same parents? Um, yeah, preferably different genetics um, would help uh, at least... It, it, Say all you've got is um, a couple different breeding groups to choose from. I would definitely choose uh, chicks that have, say, different fathers. Uh, the hens really don't matter as long as you're, you're getting a different bloodline from the father. But, uh, yeah, if you can, uh, the more diversified you are in your genetics, uh, right off the bat is going to help you out. Uh, but you got to remember that you will be selecting after generation one. You're going to start selecting the best of the best. So you're already 
um, uh, making your lines better as they produce. Um, but if you can start out with, you know, different blood, um, I would say different roosters at least would definitely help. Uh, Henriette says, hello, everyone. Just joining. Good Friday to all. Uh, Randall Merritt, uh, if there is a drawing tonight, I'd like to be added. You are added, Randall. Uh, Scott Wilson says, hello, all. Ready for eggs as well. Uh, there are no eggs. Sorry, guys. <laughs> Not tonight. Circle of Life says, good Friday, y'all. Uh, Taxi says, good question, Randall Merritt. Absolutely, it was. Uh, Patricia says, question, at what age can I safely add the birds? Hi from Virginia. Safely maybe add the birds? Uh, Patricia, I don't know. Um, if you're talking about um, adding the offspring back to the certain clan, um, the adult birds, once your birds are feathered out and out of the brooders, if this is what you're talking about, once they're feathered out and off the heat or out of the brooder, uh, you can pretty much put them in with the hens uh, because one, they're not sexually mature, so they're, they're of no real threat to the hens. So odds are they're not gonna mess with them. Um, but what I would do actually is I would let, I would grow them up just a little bit longer, maybe to the six week or even eight week mark. Um, that way, one, they're gonna go through their postnatal molt. You're gonna see a little bit better uh, patterning and coloring on their feathers. Um, yeah, if, if you can afford to, you know, keep them separated that long and grow them out, that's the way I would do it. Um, I'm pretty good about culling chicks. Um, for the most part, a lot of them right out of the egg. Um, but by the time they leave the brooder into a grow out, I pretty much have 50% of my chicks already culled out and they're not they're not killed. They're, they're called out and saved for a guy that buys them from me. Um, and then by six to eight weeks, I've reduced that number probably by another 25%. And those are the birds that I hang on to. Um, the one thing with this program, uh, spiral breeding program, you can do it two ways. You can do minimal breeding um, by setting, say, uh, just say 10 eggs from each clan uh, every other month. Or you can, you know, collect all the eggs and incubate them all and have a bunch of chicks to choose from. Um, I do it both ways. You know, I select, I have certain groups that have, you know, really nice hens in it and a really nice rooster. So I'll incubate everything that comes out of them. I have other groups that are more or less average. Um, actually, it works the other way around. I don't have to incubate as many eggs out of my really nice group as I do out of my average group, because the average groups, you want to better them. So you need more chicks to choose from. I hope that makes sense. Sometimes I sound like I'm rambling when I'm talking. Uh, Myra says, got my first egg from one of my JMF jumbo brown quail today. Congratulations. Won't be long and you'll be hatching out uh, your own line there. Uh, Mike Carr says, would you combine line breeding, then spiral back to line uh, to build a breeder, a better bird? I would not. Um, I would use the spiral breeding program to get the best you can. And then when, when you come up with a trait that you are really uh, targeting, or something that you really want to keep in your group, then line breed. Breed, you know, say it's a, a hen, breed her back to her father. Or if it's preferably a little rooster, breed that rooster back to the mother and you know, stabilize those genetics that you find desirable and pass them on that way. But once you do the line breeding, I wouldn't do it for more than, you know, say two generations. Then I would jump right back into the spiral breeding program just to stabilize those genetics a little bit more. Um, yeah, one, once you get past, you know, two generations on line breeding, you're, you're asking for trouble. You know, I, I know some people do it and some people say, hey, yeah, it's, it's no big deal, but it, it can be a big deal because a lot of a lot of the negative traits that you are trying to breed out uh, when you line breed, they won't even show until you hit like the third generation. And once you get on the third generation, then they're going to show and you want to make sure that they're gone before you uh, uh, continue on. 
Uh, see, Nick says, question, when breeding for color and size, is there a standard method as to which one to start with? Okay, I was always taught that you breed for framework first. Build your frame of your bird first. Get a nice, stable um, conformity, and then pack on the pounds. Build, you know, build them up for size. If you start out, um, well, you, you've got color in there too. Uh, that is how I would breed for my, for my jumbo size. If you want color and size, first thing I would do is breed for color first, get your color the way you want it, then breed, bring in some maybe jumbo pharaohs, breed them in and start working on your jumbo line that way. Uh, Charles says, with spiral breeding, you would need several incubators. Once the chicks hatch, it would be impossible to tell which clan they came from, even if you mark the eggs. Absolutely. I mean, no, you don't. <laughs> um, I do it all the time. Um, I, I do mark my eggs, um, but you can, when you hatch out, you can either bag the eggs when they go into lockdown and hatch them out that way. A lot of people do that. Um, but what I did was I actually divided my hatching, hatching tray. I should have brought it in here and showed you guys, but I put a divider both ways across it. So now I have four compartments inside my hatching tray. And when I take the birds out or the eggs out of the incubator um, and put them in a lockdown, I put all the same eggs in each compartment. So that way when they hatch out, I know which ones it was. And I know which clan they came from. Scott says, question, would you buy eggs from different breeders then to be sure your groups are not all related? Um, if you're just starting out, yes, that's fine. <clears throat> you can go ahead and um, be, before you're putting your clans together or your groups together, um, it's okay to go outside of your flock and bring in new genetics and start that way. Um you can do it from all, if, if you've been breeding for a while and you've got your own, um, you know, group of birds growing or your own flock and you're a little bit nervous about bringing in new blood, then you can just start with what you've got. You know, preferably try to find three different roosters that have at least a little bit of different genetic makeup in those roosters and go that way. The hens really don't matter. It's the roosters are the ones that you're going to be worried about. But yeah, you could go ahead and uh, purchase some eggs from uh, different breeders to bring them in to start with. Now, if you're talking about purchasing, like say, you know, one uh, batch of eggs from, you know, say uh, Anita Garrett and then some eggs from Michael Rose and some eggs say for me, um, you could do that, but it's really not necessary. Most of the larger breeders, at least, you know, Michael I know does it, Anita I know does it, um, Kansas City Quail, they have a diverse enough flock genetically um, that when you're buying eggs from them, you're getting a very wide, say even if you only bought 30 eggs, you're still getting a wide group of genetics just out of those 30 eggs. So, yeah, I wouldn't worry about, about you know, buying, you know, 40 eggs from him and 40 eggs from him, 40 eggs from somebody else. You really don't need to go that route. Taxi says, thank you. Uh, as always, good info. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Circle of Life says, uh, great explanation. Yeah, I, I hope. Yeah, I hope I didn't mess this up for you guys. I mean, in my head, I understand it. Um, that's why I kind of put together the the little slideshow, uh, and I will, like I say, I will upload that over on the Turner's Corner Facebook group page, uh, just in case you guys want to, you know, refresh your memory or have something to look back on. But also do a, a, a search on Google. Um, I think I found. Oh, maybe two good articles on spiral breeding or clan breeding. Uh, this was back two or three years ago. And then I think I even found a decent uh, video on YouTube. Um, so, yeah, you know, the, the information's out there if you want more information than what I gave you. Um, but I didn't want to make it too uh, technical because I didn't want to, you know, I, I think it's easier to start off with the basics and then, you know, grow into it. Uh, Donna says, y'all, one of my quails almost became gator dinner yesterday. I was trying to figure out the sex of my quail, and one decided to fly. Uh, she did right over the fence and into the retention pond. Uh, wow, that's kind of scary. Amy says, hi, everyone. Happy Good Friday. 
Okay, I am banning this guy out of here altogether. Uh, I don't know where... I guess my moderators could not get to this. Uh, luckily for me and my program, I have the option of uh, banning people right from here. So, uh, Michelle says, so when tagging the chicks, the color matches the mother. But if you want to also keep track of the sire who partnered that chick, how is best to document that? Exact same way. Uh, say the bird came from uh, the yellow clan, uh, but with a blue rooster, put a yellow band on and a blue band. Um, that way, you know, uh, actually, it probably worked better to put the, the yellow band for the clan on the left leg and the father or the genetic side of it on the right leg. That way you can just glance at it and say, okay, left leg, I know what clan that chick's from. I also know by looking at the right leg who the father was. And I do that um, with colors too. I will actually, if I know a bird is um, uh, heterozygous for something that's not showing, I will actually ban the right leg just so I have an idea of what birds might be carrying what. I have a, a really goofy, if you guys looked at some of my birds, you would, you would kind of laugh because I have some birds that have you know, two bands on one foot and three on the other. And just, what's this guy trying to do here? Uh, Lorinda says, uh, how, a question, how long are they with each clan group? Um, that's really up to you. Uh, the, the roosters can be rotated after. Okay, let me, let me start over. Say, say you, you just started out and you uh you got the blue rooster blue hen yellow green um you select chicks from there to replenish your original um clan of the same color but then the the rooster is going to move over to the next clan you can do one of two things and preferably you're going to grow up the best male chick who's going to be better than his father and he's going to be the one to move over so he's going to take, you know, eight to 10 weeks before he's sexually mature. So from the time he hatches, you're looking at eight to 10 weeks before you can move him. If you don't get a rooster out of that first group and you want to keep this original male in with that first clan, you can do a second generation and breed again. So now you're looking at, uh, you know, the hatching time, uh, which would be, you know, 17 or 18 days plus another eight weeks to 10 weeks. Uh, before that second generation grows up and then move them. So it's really up to you. That's what I say. The Coternix breed and grow so fast that um, it's up to you how how many generations. See, I hate calling them generations because once you move them, it's considered a generation. So uh, trying to think of the best way to explain it. Uh, it's up to you how many times you want to keep each individual clan together and how many uh, hatchings that you want to do out of that group before you select the breeders to move on to the second group. I hope that made sense. Okay, continued on with the drama from Donna's and her gator chick. She stayed in the pond until she decided she could swim back to shore. That's good. Gator was real close, but husband chased him with a BB gun. That's cool. At least the chicks made it. Uh, Scuba Healer says, I had 18 hatch. Congratulations. Uh, Rob Me Too says, how are you from Fort Myers, Florida? Uh, I'm great. I'm also from Fort Myers, so welcome. Andrew says, awesome, Terry. Always learning from your shows. Well, that's good. I mean, that's what we put them together for. I was a little bit uh, hesitant about uh, jumping right in from the beginner series into an intermediate series because I didn't know I didn't know how many people were actually at that point in their quail career that uh, you know they they wanted more advanced information but you know now that I think about it I wasn't into you know you're only a beginner until you try it once after you've done it once you pretty much got the experience so yeah it goes quick uh, let's see uh, Stephen says, is there a difference between jumbo wild and ferals? No, um, jumbo is just a weight designator, um, but wild and feral, a wild type or a pharaoh are the same color. 
Uh, and also here in the U.S., a lot of people will call them jumbo browns. Uh, and where the brown came from is because um, most of the feral lines in the U.S. carry the sex link brown mutation. So uh, when you hear jumbo wild or jumbo feral or jumbo brown, for the most part, everybody's referring to the same bird. Scuba Healer says, for my first hatch, day 17, I had 18 new babies. Congratulations. Uh, Tim says, does one color always go to the next? Example, blue to yellow, yellow to green, uh, green to blue. Do the males always switch to the same color? Um, yes and no. Uh, the only birds that move are your roosters. You'll take the rooster, say you've got uh, your first First clan is blue and blue, which is blue hen, blue rooster. Um, you're going to select an offspring from that mating or from that hatch. Uh, you're going to grow him out, and that will be a blue rooster also. But he's going to move on to the second clan, and he will be breeding with what do you got? Blue to yellow. So that blue will be breeding. That blue rooster will be breeding to your yellow uh, hens. And then when you go onto the next generation from that yellow group, you're going to do the same thing. You're going to select one of the offspring from them, uh, preferably a rooster who is better than his dad, and he will be a yellow rooster. He's going to move on to your green. So I hope that makes sense, and I hope you understand it. If you don't, uh, get a hold of me over on Facebook. I know you're on the, the group over there, Tim, uh, and I'll try to help you out a little bit better on that. Steven says, hello, all from Wyoming. Hello, Steve. Glad you can make it. Uh, Myra says, I'm in New Jersey. God bless you this good Friday. Absolutely. You too. Thank you very much. Uh, Shelby says, hello, or yeah, hello from Alabama. Peace. Peace to you too. <clears throat> Robert Davis says, question. So spiral breeding, you always have just three original clans. Yes. Once you, you can have more than three, but you really only need three. Um, for each color that you're working with, yes, you need to have three clans. But them clans are always your three original clans. The only thing is, is you are changing out the breeders in each of those clans with offspring produced by that clan. Uh, the hens will always stay in that clan. So, yes, you are right. Barbara says, question, what do you use to scrape your dropping pans? I use, um, it's a, a basically a, a flat trowel um, for like using for uh, plaster work. Pick them up at Home Depot. I think they're like eight or nine dollars, something like that. Pretty inexpensive. Uh, Sonny Jones says, could you please talk more on Balut? Um, actually, we may do a video on that. Uh, I have... Uh, a guy, and I see he's in the group now. Uh, his name's Mark from the Rochelle Farm. Uh, maybe we can bring him on because Mark's going to be working pretty heavily here with Balut in the near future, and he would be a perfect guy to come on here and talk to you about it. Uh, I have a little experience with it, but um, probably not enough to, well, I mean, I probably could, but it'd be better with Mark. He's a funny guy. Grant says, happy Good Friday, all. Terry, thanks for educating us newbies. Absolutely. Uh, thank you for joining us. Really appreciate it. Uh, Donna says, I also had to learn yesterday real quick to process a quail. Thank you, Terry. I watched you on YouTube, uh, how you did it. She had an egg that would not come out. She died from it. Yeah, occasionally you will, you'll get a, a hen that will you know get egg bound. And uh, uh, for the most time, most part, it usually does end up putting them down. Uh, Andrew says, I'm wanting to put my new quail outside. I'm in Vermont, so it's still cold at night in the 30s. Uh, when can I put them outside without heat? Uh, once they're fully feathered out, usually around four or five weeks, they should be just fine. Um, yeah, just look at them. Make sure they're fully feathered and they're pretty much ready to go outside. And especially if you're putting, you know, a bunch of birds together in the, in the same pen, they'll huddle up. If they get chilly at night, they'll huddle up together and keep each other warm. Uh, Underhill says, how many hens and roosters would I need to be slaughtering one bird a day? Um, okay, you want to butcher one bird a day, so there's 30 birds uh, in a month. And you, uh, let's see, to collect 30 eggs, 
a week, you would need, we'll just say five. That's going to give you in six days, we'll give you 30, but we're going to give you a five extra for seven days. So you have 35 that you can throw in the incubator. Um, so yeah, we'll say, we'll say five hens and one rooster and just keep breeding them and keep incubating your eggs. Jennifer Chick says, good Friday to all. I'm a little late. That's fine. Rob Me Too says, thank you for that answer. Absolutely. Uh, Dequats. I hope I said that right. Everyone wants his eggs. I don't have any eggs. Sorry, guys. Uh, Rob Me Too, you have a wonderful Easter. Absolutely. Same to you. Cynthia says, question, what, what feed do you use for your chicks? I use a 30% game bird starter made by Perina. Uh, it's the same stuff that... Uh, Pretty much all the tractor supplies carry. Um, occasionally, if I can't get that, there is a local mill that sells a 32% game bird starter. Uh, but I really don't like using um, that game bird starter because it, it's very powdery. It's it's like you're getting the bottom of the barrel every time. So, Little Ridge Farms says, question, do you keep your male breeder cages separated uh, from other females? that he's not breeding or do you have them above or next to the female cages? Um, if you're talking about in a spiral breeding program, um, you can do it both ways. Um, I just started pulling my roosters out of the hens cages uh, because after talking with Tamara Roselle, what you can do is keep your roosters housed separately and then once a week, just bring the rooster over to the hen's cage, leave him in for a day. At the end of the day, pull him out and uh, put him back in his bachelor pad. Um, that basically just gives your hens a break from the rooster, especially if you have a rooster who is, you know, a really aggressive breeder, um, pulling feathers out of the head, uh, tearing their backs up, you know, uh, stuff like that. But you can do it both ways. You can leave your males in. Um, or you can pull them out, whichever you want to do. Um, or do you have them above or next to the females' cages? No, I actually have mine. My roosters can't even see the hens uh, when they're separated from them. But the breeding program that I'm doing now, the spiral breeding program, is with my um, uh, pharaohs. And those roosters stay in with the pharaohs all the time. Um, I don't pull them out. Uh, Amy says, question, we are day 15 with our first hatch. Would you start your three groups from this hatch and consider it the first generation or should you hatch an additional group of eggs? Um, let's see, you're on day 15 with your first hatch. If you have enough adult birds already to where you can pick three roosters and enough hens for each one of your groups, you can go that way or you can take this group that's hatching out now, grow them out, and select from that group to start your initial um, your initial first groups. I guess it's going to be up to you. Um, if you're, if the parents of these that are hatching right now are young enough, you know, just started laying, just started breeding for this year, yeah, go ahead and, and make up, make your, your groups from them or your clans from them. If you have enough birds, if you don't go ahead and wait till these chicks grow up, select the best and, uh, and, uh, yeah, add them to your groups. I, I read a question. <laughs> Sorry. Th totally threw me off. Uh, Patricia says, uh, at what age do you band your birds? Um, for the most part, right around three weeks, uh, sometimes two, if I know that there's a bird in there that I want to keep, I'll put a band on them for that. But, um, for my spiral breeding program, those chicks are all uh, brooded in individual brooders. So I know which brooder contains what clan of birds. Um, but usually when I, I, I start banding, when I start culling, and three weeks is usually around my first call, um, I'll go through and I will... Uh, you know, at least ban them for the group because at three weeks, it's time to go from the brooder into a grow out pen. And sometimes I will mix uh, birds from different clans in the grow out pens because it's a bigger cage. Um, 
and I'll band them before I put them all together. That way, when I go to separate them back into their clans or into their groups, I know which ones came from which group. Del Chuchu says, what is the most generations you would recommend from just one rooster? If you're doing the spiral breeding program, um, well, that's really not going to fit into the spiral breeding program because you want to select the offspring from that rooster. Um, I wouldn't I wouldn't say generations. I would go, you know, age of the rooster. I usually let my roosters go about eight months, maybe up to 10 months before I retire them. And that's only because I'm trying to make sure that my hens are, you know, fertilized. Um, but if I, if I had a really, really nice rooster, like a really nice colored one, I would hang on to them for a little bit longer, you know, up to a year, maybe even a year and a half, uh, just so I've got that rooster to breed back, you know, to other stuff. So, yeah, you didn't say if you're talking about in a, in a spiral breeding program or outside, just in a normal breeding. Uh, I'm not even going to be able to say this name. Malek. Malek Dayad Benya. <laughs> I hope I didn't really butcher that one. But our two-year-old girl just laid her eggs shortly after that fell. Two foot broke something. Maybe calcium. Is that a genetic or is there some deficiency in some of the products on the market? Our two-year-old girl just laid eggs. Just laid her eggs shortly after that fell two foot and broke something. Okay, what fell, the egg or the bird? Um, just laid her eggs and shortly after that fell two foot and broke something. Um, if she fell two foot and broke like say a leg or even a wing bone, that I don't even think would be a, you know, a sign of a lack of calcium. If her eggshells are good and hard, she's not lacking calcium. Um, and as far as, uh, I, I wouldn't think it would be genetic. Uh, and a deficiency in the, the feed, you know, possibly, uh, but I mean, a two foot drop, you know, especially if she wasn't ready for it, you know, she didn't have the ability to get her wings out, you know, to kind of support her weight as she was falling. Um, yeah. I would, I would look at her eggs first. If her, if her eggs are good and strong. Um, I wouldn't think it would be a calcium deficiency. Um, as far as like a genetic um, bone density issue possibility. Um, but yeah, without looking at the bird, that one's a really hard call. Uh, La Rochelle Farm says, hello, everyone. Question. So for jumbo, you feel it's easier to use a jumbo ferro mix with whichever standard size you want to increase versus using the same color and just breeding largest to largest. Um, yeah, it's easiest, Mark, to take a bird that is already making jumbo weight and introduce that into a standard size weight um, and increase it that way. You know, I mean, because every color has got ferro beneath it, even though it may be hidden. Uh, every color has got ferro there, so it's not going to hurt to to put a jumbo ferro in with uh, your standards to increase size. And I, I take it you're wanting to increase your, your fab fees. That's exactly what I'm doing now. I am using my fab fees, breeding them to one of my jumbo feral roosters, and that is going to give me my, uh, what on earth is this guy back again for? I guess our moderators are having a hard time banning this guy. Sorry about that, guys. We got some idiot that loves to come in here. I got a feeling that's one of my haters from... Never mind, I ain't going to say it. Uh, Donna says, question, I have a tuxedo that I really like, pure black, uh, and what with no other color. Would love to breed it, but I don't have any males. What can I do? You have a tuxedo that you really like. Okay, so it's a, a pure black, you got a pure black bird that you want to, uh, I'm taking it's a, a hand because you say you don't have, uh, any other males. Uh, do you have a feral rooster that you can breed with it? <clears throat> it preferably if you had a, uh, a recessive white or, you know, a dotted white, uh, that's what I would use to breed back to a solid black hen. Um, 
Yeah. Let let me know if that pure black is a hen or a rooster. <clears throat> I wonder which would produce the jumbo faster. Uh, in my eyes, breeding the feral back to your fab fees is going to give you the weight that you need. Uh, and then obviously you're probably going to, you are going to get some uh, heterozygous fee. So you're going to have to breed the hets back to your homozygous fee um, to get back into homozygous. Uh, but you got to remember, you, you have to select, just because you introduced a jumbo to your fee line, you still have to select all birds that make jumbo weights, or you're just going to be, you know, bouncing in between jumbo and standard uh, weights. Uh, Michelle says, I think this was the perfect transition from beginner to intermediate. Good. I'm glad. Um, I was a little bit concerned with it, but uh, yeah, I'm, I'm glad as long as you guys are, you know, grasping, you know, this topic. I think this is a really important topic, guys, because uh, I hate to see people. No, I don't. I don't hate. I don't want to say that. I see so many people saying, you know, how many generations can I breed these birds before I need to introduce new blood? That right there scares me. When you said introduce new blood, that means you're going to go outside your flock. You're going to buy birds from, you know, Joe Blow down the road. You have no idea what you're getting. You're going to bring it in and all your hard work that you've done trying to clean up your lines or, you know, make your lines better, breed out the, the bad traits. You, you may have just reintroduced them. So, yeah, to me, it's I'm, I'm glad that, you know, people are, uh, you know, taking interest in cleaning up your lines and interest in basic genetics. Uh, Juan says, yo, yo, yo. Welcome, Juan. Glad you can make it. Gary says, uh, being a newbie to Raising Quail, I've learned so much from watching you live than going back to your videos. Cool. I'm glad to hear that. Um, that's what we put them out there for. Uh, Juan, as a matter of fact, I got to get back into doing more videos for the channel. I'm, I'm really busy right now working with my stuff and then doing two lives a week. It's really hard for me to, to go out and sit down and shoot a video, you know, to come up with a, a, a topic and a project to work on. Uh, I did do a video today, but it won't be um, uploaded probably until Sunday or Monday. And that was just a real short, simple video. Uh, Tim says, Happy Easter, everyone. Deplorable, Kofifi55. Uh, just got here. What is it, Terry, drawing for tonight? Um, we have uh, one of our sponsors for tonight's show, Northwest Quail Farm donate uh, the watering system, which is automatic nipples, or a uh, starter pack of quail egg cartons, uh, where he also includes 25 personalized labels uh, with your name on it um, to, you know, go with those. Underhill says, uh, hit that like button, y'all. Yeah, this, we are a little slack on likes tonight. We only got 66 people watching anyhow, so uh, kind of a quiet night. Uh, Texas says, question, if you leave the rooster in with a hen for a few days and then pull the eggs, pull eggs from days two or three, can you eat the eggs from day one? Absolutely. Uh, is there any difference in fertilized? No. Every egg that comes out of my flock uh, is fertilized and I eat them, hatch them. Um, yeah, there's, there's no difference. Not going to, not going to bother you a bit. Uh, David's in the house. Is high from Oklahoma. Michelle says, I read Del Chuchu's question about one rooster to mean how many generations could you use that one rooster to breed back to his daughters and granddaughters, etc., back to him before replacing him. Okay, um, I would not go, if, if that's what he meant, I would not go more than two generations on a father-to-daughter breeding um, and then even a father-to-granddaughter one generation. Uh, because if you look at the chart when you breed a line breed, uh, say uh, father to daughter, the offspring automatically are carrying three quarters of the father's genetics. So if you breed that one again, then you've got way too many, almost 100% of the father's genetics in there. That's where you, when you're going to start running into, um, you know, genetic, I can't remember the word, it starts with a D, delete. You're basically, uh, what is the word? I can't even think of it. Uh, it 
it's you're going to run into genetic issues, and most of the time it's not going to be good. Um, so, yeah, I would I would use him no more than two generations on line breeding, um, and then on uh, spiral breeding, his bloodline can go, you know, up to twenty generations. So, Charles says, question: Are there feeds that can change the meat flavor, possibly enhance the flavor? I can't answer that. I really don't know. Um, I have heard that feed that are high in fish meal um, can give your meat and eggs. Well, I don't know about meat, but I have heard that uh, the eggs can get a fishy flavor to them. I, I would have to uh, I would have to check on that as far as uh, the meat. I don't know if the meat will pick up the flavor or not. Uh, Juan says keeping the males alone from the hens might keep them useful longer. Being that they get a rest and are hungry, if you catch my drift. Um, I don't know, though. I'm planning on setting up a SBP um, spiral breeding program with my first chicks. Um, yeah, and that's one of the, the reasons that Tamara uh, said that you, you can do that. And it's actually a beneficial to do that is because um, not only are you giving the hens a break, but you're giving the rooster up to a week break if you're not using him to breed to say another group. But if you're doing it uh, just for you know a spiral breeding program, yeah, you're giving him a week break. And by the time you put him back in with the hens, he's re you know raring to go and he's going to, uh, he's gonna go ahead and, uh, I'm reading the, the next question, sorry. But yeah. You're, you're absolutely right, Juan. Donna says black and white hen. Okay, so it's black and white hen. So she's already uh, carrying dotted white. Uh, breed her back to a feral male if you have one. And I think the next comment was no. Um, yeah. If, it's, if you need to breed, you need to breed that hen. If you can breed her back to a feral male, then uh, you're, you're going to produce some birds that have, you know, either, they'll either be uh, Faro, black and white, tuxedo, or uh, recessive white. Uh, you may even get some Faro tuxes out of it, I believe. I don't do tuxedos, so I'm kind of guessing on that one. But yeah, back to Faro would be uh, perfect. Uh, Dequats, Dequats, I wish I knew what that was. Uh, black is dominant in chickens, is it in quail too? Um, that depends if it's recessive black or not. I do not know as far as, I believe that the blacks that like, uh, Donna's talking about are just really dark, um, grouchy. Um, and I don't believe that recessive black is in the public hands yet. So to answer your question, I don't know, to be honest with you. Uh, Lewis says, question, Terry, do they make watering kits that I can run from my water spigot to my cages? Um, no, but you could easily make one. The easiest way to do it is to run a, from your water spigot to a five gallon bucket with a toilet fill valve installed in the five gallon bucket. Just drill you a hole in the five gallon bucket, install that fill valve, screw your hose onto that. You may have to get an adapter. Uh, and then feed the cages off that five gallon bucket. That way they, that bucket automatically fills up every time and the cages stay full. I had considered doing that. Um, the only reason I didn't uh, was when I was working, I was gone all day long, there was nobody here at the house and I was always worried about if that valve stuck open, it's just gonna continually flood my shop and I can't have that, so. Uh, Patricia says, I understand more from your videos uh, than some I have watched. Well, that's good. I'm glad uh, I'm glad we're explaining it correctly. Anyhow, uh, Bass says, uh, can I be added to the drawing, please? Absolutely. You are added. Tammy says, how do you enter the drawing? You just did, Tammy. <clears throat> Texas Caternix Quail Connection says, I love to have the auto nipples. I'm still waiting on mine. I believe Mark got some. 
he's going to test them out and let me know how they do for him. Uh, okay, Henriette says you don't need to enter, just being here in the chat. You're already entered. Um, just being here. One day 268 says this is so helpful. Thank you. Absolutely. Uh, Juan says, Lewis, you probably need a water pressure regulator uh, to tone down the water pressure for your nipples or cups. Uh, as long as you can hook it up to a hose, you should should replace your reservoir. Yeah, I would. Uh, you're absolutely, you would have to uh, step it down. But I think I would just use a, a reservoir that has uh, like the toilet fill valve in it. Um, I think that's going to work better for you. Uh, Mark says, Terry, what's your opinion on soft shell and shellless eggs? New layers just getting the plumbing working or a feed issue. I'm going to give it another couple weeks of laying before I say feed issue. I would definitely say it's a new layer issue. Um, I have I have hens that are, you know, 10 weeks old and still laying soft shelled eggs. Or I even have one hen that's laying a shellless egg and I'm finding the the yolk and the, and the egg on the manure tray. Uh, but usually it clears up, you know, after a couple of weeks, uh, just give her some time. She's just, uh, if you're not having any issues <clears throat> with your other birds, you know, all your eggs and your shells are in good shape with the, the rest of the birds in that, that cage, I would definitely think it's the bird and not the, the feed. Uh, but if you're concerned, you could always add, you know, some oyster shell to it. You, you can actually free feed the oyster shell to it. They'll, they're only going to take what they need. Um, Cynthia says, when you separate your roosters, do you cage them together? I do. Um, a lot of my roosters get moved right outside into my aviary, and I'll grow them out out there uh, just so I have a, an area where uh, I can sit out there and I can watch the roosters because when I'm selecting roosters, I just can't look into a cage and say, okay, I like that one. I like to be able to sit out there in the aviary and watch them, um, see how their conformity is as far as how they stand up tall like a peacock. Uh, coloration, coloration is a lot different out in, in sunlight than it is inside the building. So, uh, yeah, I do house them together in both both scenarios, out in the aviary and in the, um, in the uh, draw pens. Fat Outdoors says, happy Good Friday from Yuba City, California. First time catching the live. Good stuff. Um, cool. Glad you're enjoying it. That's a nice looking striper you got there. Um, let's see. Rochelle Farm says, uh, I'm with you, Terry. I'm worried about that one day the water valve gets stuck and I come home to a wet barn. Yeah, the only that's the one reason I say uh, use the, the toilet valve, the toilet fill valve, is because... You know, for the most part, your toilet, you usually don't have problems with the toilet. The nice thing about the toilet is if it does keep running, it just flows into a septic system. Um, but yeah, I, I, I feel you on that one there, Mark. Uh, Randall says, awesome stuff tonight. Thanks for answering my questions. Still a beginner and will definitely have to go back and rewatch, uh, but starting to make sense. Uh, Randall, go over to the playlist on the Caternus Corner YouTube channel. Um, we have a playlist called uh, Shop Talk Live Beginners Series. Um, there's like, uh, I think, six or seven videos in there that'll get you from day one right up through breeding and hatching out your own stuff. So uh, it's really good for beginners. They're not talking to me. DJ Muller says, I thank you so much for all the videos. Love the live talk, visits to other breeders and giveaways. Uh, I built the three tiered. You so carefully explained how to do uh, one regular level with two rollouts. Very good. Glad to hear it. Uh, Charles says you could install an overflow pipe. Yeah, there you go. Mark says, yeah, it's uh, just as easy to top off the tanks with a hose. That's exactly what I do. I know how full they are. I know exactly how much water will be spilling on the floor if something should stick open. Uh, DJ Muller says, looking forward to April 29th genetics. Uh, if you are talking about the live stream, hold on, I got to check my calendar. I believe it's the 26th. Yeah, the 26th. That's on a Tuesday. 
it's on Katernick's Corner Live. Uh, we have William Carl Foster, Michael Rose, and Dana Manchester are going to be coming on the show and talking about um, how and when all the different mutations made it into the states. So that's going to be a really good show, guys. Mark that one on your calendar. Uh, next week, Tuesday, is Del Chuchu, uh, Juan from the Cuba, uh, from Cuba. He's going to be on Tuesday, so check that out. Next week, Friday, we're also doing another Shop Talk Live breeder series. Haven't come up with a topic yet, but I'll let you know. Uh, LaRochelle Farm says, good show tonight, Terry. I appreciate it, Mark. Thank you very much. I'm glad you could join us. Um, and hopefully we'll see you Tuesday. I don't know if you're still doing the soccer thing on Tuesday nights, but, uh, if not, you can always watch the replay. Okay, guys, so that brings us down to the bottom of the list. Um, I do need to go back up and check for a winner for the uh, the giveaway. Uh, I do need the winner to let me know which one of these they want. Do you want the watering system with the automatic bird nipples? Or do you want the starter pack of quail egg cartons? I believe there's 25, yeah, 25, 12 cell cartons. And the winner for that for tonight is going to be Bass Lane. Bass Lane, you are our winner. If you would uh, email me your information, I need a name, shipping address, a good email, and a good phone number um, because... Uh, Northwest Farms needs to contact you to find out um, what, well, you're going to let me know what you want. So let me know whether you want the water system, uh, the water nipples, or the uh, quail egg cartons, uh, and we'll take it from there. So the email is Terry, T-E-R-R-Y, at Caternix Corner. And if one of my moderators would put that on there, uh, Little Ridge Farm got it. Very good. Thank you, uh Little Ridge Farm for doing that. Um, and uh, thank you, Bass Lane. I'll write your name down so I don't forget it. Okay, uh, guys, we're going to go ahead and call it a night. Uh, it's already 10 minutes to 9, so we're actually getting done about uh, 10 minutes early tonight, so that's a good thing. Uh, again, um, I want to say thank you to our moderators, um, Henriette and... Uh, um, um, Little Ridge Farm, <laughs> Mark Wilson, uh, thanks for joining us tonight and uh, keeping an eye on the chat room. And I don't know why, what the deal is. I'm, I've got to get it somehow to where you guys can ban uh, uh, spammers that are coming into the chat room. But guys, uh, don't forget to join us Tuesday, Katornik's Corner Live. Uh, we go live at 7 o'clock um, p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, Del Chuchu, who is Juan. Uh, is joining us from Cuba. Uh, he's already sent over a bunch of photos. It looks like a really interesting uh, setup. I talked to him for quite a while on the phone, and uh, they do things a little bit different over there, so it, it ought to be a really interesting show, guys. So join us for that one. Also, mark on your calendars, the 26th of this month uh, will be the uh, uh, Mutations Talk with uh, Dana Manchester, William Carl Foster, and Michael Rose. Uh, put that one on the calendar. And again, uh, next week, Friday's live uh, for the beginner series. I will post over on Facebook uh, to let you know what the topic is. So, guys, I hope you enjoyed the show tonight. Thank, thanks to everyone who joined us. Thanks for all the great, great questions. Um, have a very happy Easter. Uh, enjoy your good Friday and enjoy the weekend. And we will see you guys on Tuesday. Have a good night.